All right. Well, here we are, Facebook Live, uh, giving this a run. We're going to give a couple uh, minutes here just for people to sign in, get on, uh, be able to say hello, things like that. Say, hey, hey, Hillary, good to see you. Kim, good to see you on here. Uh, Alexa, how are you? Good to see you. Good. Deidre, so good to see you guys. Thank you for, for making sure that you're chiming in. Um, also want to make sure that you guys know that we want you to interact with this. Uh, we want you to participate. Um, I'll have to read it. So I know this is going to be a little bit strange. It's going to be different. <clears throat> We've never really done it this way before. Uh, but we want to... Ooh, Kelly Underhill going. Wow. She must have got saved. Who knew? Only took Corona to get my wife saved. That's great. Um, Alan, good to see you. Chad McGugan, good to see you. The Woods, Jordan Woods. Awesome. Good to see you guys. Man, it has been crazy, crazy week. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> it has been nuts uh, to think about all the things going on, you know. So we're just going to give maybe another 10, 15 seconds, uh, let more people kind of get on. Hey, good to see you, Kathy. Oh, all the way from Houston. The puckets are on. That's so good. Oh, the Womacks. Doug Hansen. Whoa, we're getting all the way to New York today. That's awesome. Oh, Ricarda, good to see you. Hope you're feeling better, kiddo. Heard, heard you were not feeling too well, so we'll be praying for you for sure. And then Clary, good to see you. Uh-oh, everybody. Jenny Taunton just got on. Now we're official. We are now official because Jenny Taunton has finally arrived in the building, folks. But good to see you guys and excited to see you guys. Zach, good to see you. <laughs> Whoa, happy birthday, Jeanette. Is today Jeanette's birthday? Well, we should all sing then, right? Um, well, I, I do want to kind of get going with you guys. Oh, Judy, good to see you guys. All the way in Salado. That's great. Lisa Firstler, good to see you, Lisa. Ben, that's good, good. Tom Taylor, how many guys that cardboard cutout scared the living daylights out of you guys, <laughs> right? At church, it jumped me so many times, it was crazy. But, all right, we are going to kind of get going here. Um, if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to continue in the book of Colossians. One of the things I thought we should do is, you know, keep creating normal things that we do because everything in our world right now isn't normal. Our schedules aren't normal. <laughs> going to HEB is not normal right now. I mean, there are things that are just kind of out of sorts. And so really wanted to um, kind of get back to some normalcy. We started this series, and as I prayed for you, as I spent time looking at this scripture, I was like, this is so applicable for right now, what we're doing, what we're experiencing. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and go to Colossians chapter 1, right? We're going to read verses 9 and verses 10 today. We're not going to get very far in these verses because they are packed full of stuff for us uh, that God has for us. So why don't we just start reading these together? This is what it says. It says in verse nine, it says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is such a mouthful. There's so much in there about, you know, from the day we heard about you, we prayed for you, asking you to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that those are some big words. I don't know for you, a lot of people get very intimidated about God's will for them. What's God's will? What does he want me to do? How does he, how does he want me to engage? What do you want me to do? Well, understand this. We, we talked about this a little bit the last Sunday that we were together. And it said, you know, knowing God's will and the, you know, the knowledge of his will is really the ability to see things from his perspective. How does God see this? And so when you think about what we're experiencing today, how does God view this? Now, there's the age-old question of how could God let this happen? 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not a this is not a God problem, okay? This is a sin and brokenness problem that starts all the way back in the Garden of Eden. God doesn't want this stuff. God doesn't like disease. God does not like uh, people that are suffering and being isolated and quarantined. In fact, it was man's decision, okay, our sin, our own selfishness that got us into this mix. So it's not God at all. In fact, it's kind of a consequence of our own actions. In fact, he prepared a way for us to be able to bridge this isolation because we broke the relationship with him. But understanding the knowledge of his will, in order to know how he sees things, okay, then we have to kind of spend time in proximity with him. I talked about this a little bit last time that we were together. And I was talking about how my wife, she can finish my sentences. Like she can, she'll know what I'm thinking just by the dumb look that's on my face. I'll be like, <laughs> she'll be like, stop it, <laughs> you know, and she'll know exactly what I'm thinking. In fact, we've been married close to almost 20 years now. And it's a little freaky how she can know exactly what I'm thinking just by the dumb look on my face. So it, we want to kind of bring that into the spiritual realm and say, well, what is God's face saying? What's the look that's on his face? Right? What is it that he's experiencing when he looks at our community? When he looks at what's happening in our world? When he looks and he sees what's happening in our homes, which is where we all are today. What's the look on God's face? How does he view the way we're parenting? How does he view the language we use? Eeks, right? How does he view the way we talk to each other? Or the way we talk about each other? You know, and sometimes, if we're all painfully honest, we talk a little bit about each other. Not so great when other people aren't around. But we've got to be honest about that. I love that more people are still chiming in. Good to see you, Firstlers, and good to see the Bagleys, and David Logan, good to see you guys. But I want to continue down that thought. You know, we have to, in order to know the knowledge of his will, what Colossians 1.9 is talking about, the knowledge of his will is we have to understand how he sees things. And if we understand how he sees things, okay, then it changes how we respond to things. But the only way that we're going to know, okay, how he sees things, okay, is by staying close to him. And there are things like in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God wants to reward those who diligently, diligently seek him, okay? And we know what he thinks by staying close to him, okay? How he does things, okay? What does he think about the way we live relationally? What's God's view of how we live our lives sexually? What about financially? What about in our community? See, I think we have to ask those questions. How does God view this? How is God using this situation right now to draw people closer together? Now, I understand social distancing is a thing we're supposed to be doing, but just because we're separate, doesn't mean we have to be alone. You're not alone. You're never going to be alone. As long as God is God, you're not alone. Because there's three parts to Him. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all fully God. He exists in community Himself, right? And so we want to make sure we're thinking about things the way He's thinking. If we want to be filled with the knowledge of His will, then we have to spend time in His Word. In order to know how he thinks, we have to know what he said, right? It makes sense. When you think about how much time we spend on social media, even though we're using it for a good thing today, but we think about how much time we just, just mindlessly scroll through pages of people's content, we get to know more about their life because we're watching, we're reading it, we're reading their stories, we're seeing their pictures. We're watching the life unfold. If we want to know more about God's will for us, we have to know his word. And we have to get into his word. Psalm 119.11. This is what it says. It says this. The, your word 
I have stored in my heart that I might not sin against you. Because we need to be putting God's word into our heart. Talk about something that we don't do very much anymore. One, read our Bibles. But two, memorize scripture. And I want to encourage you, make time to memorize. Put it in your heart. Put it, the scripture back in your heart. Memorizing the scripture, okay, it'll be available when you need it. So say hypothetically there was a pandemic that was going on and fear was gripping people and anxiety of what's going to happen with my job and what's going to happen with this, my family, my finances. What if my kids get sick? What if I get sick? Hold on, hold on. If we understood and we've hidden his word in our heart, then we know that he who's in us is greater than he who's in the world. And his hand is not so short that he cannot save, that we're not all held safe in his hand. Doesn't mean bad things don't happen. It just means, what's the worst that's gonna happen? If we were to die, we'd be with him. I know there would be a lot of emotional loss. I know that there'd be some crying. I know that there, let's just, let's just face it. If I were to no longer be here, you guys would cry for about a week, but life would move on, okay? You guys would move on. You'd continue to go to work. You'd continue to do things. And as you do, right, as you do those things, life just continues to keep moving forward. The worst that can be done to us is to go be with the Lord. We win as Christians. We win so much, okay? But we have to be putting his word into our heart. So make scripture memorization a priority. Write it down. Put it on a piece of paper. Put it in your pocket. Carry it with you. Okay? You would be surprised at how much you'll use that scripture if you put it in your pocket. So that the other thing that happens when you put uh, the word in you is when life throws you a curve, you know what to do. You know how to respond to things. You know how to react, to respond instead of react, okay? And we have to understand that is huge for us, okay? Second, I want to talk about, it goes on in that verse 9 and verse 10. It talks about all spiritual wisdom, right? Do we understand the mysteries of God? What is the spiritual wisdom that you have? It's a hard question. What is... What is it that you know about God that maybe other people don't? What is it that because you've spent time with him, he's shown you? And because he's shown you those things, you can then bless other people with those things. Because the reality is, there are physical laws that rule our world. It's important we know them. Gravity, it's a thing. If I walk up on the roof of my house and I jump off, I'm going to fall. I'm heavy. I will hit the ground. It is a physical law. I can not believe in it, okay? Well, for me, I don't think it's true. You're going to fall, bro. You're going to bust your butt, okay? Those are physical laws. Just as much as there are physical laws, there are spiritual laws. And the spiritual laws supersede the physical laws. How do we know? Think about your Bible for a minute. The Red Sea, when Moses goes in and God parts it, water shouldn't just be standing up for no reason unless the supernatural got engaged. Why did he get engaged? Because they were seeking his will, because they were obeying his word. They were walking out what he had called them to be. Cornerstone family, do you see what I'm getting at here? Like there's things we need to be doing. There are things we need to be being Right? So that that way God can accomplish what he wants to do on this earth by setting other people free. Okay? And he wants to use you and me to do it. In fact, in Proverbs 25, 2, this is what it says. It says, it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search it out. In other words, everything's not easy. Sometimes God hides little mysteries. It's kind of like playing hide and seek. Right? I play hide and seek sometimes, or I chase Eden. Like Eden is my seven year old, right? Now, obviously, I could hide from her, right? And make her not find me. 
However, it's more of the relationship that's built in us being together and her chasing it and me finding her and the beauty of what's happening relationally in that moment, okay? And God is showing us here that he's like, look, there are some things that are hidden mysteries in this world and it's your glory to search them out. And the way you search them out is spending time in his word, spending time looking for him, okay? So that, that way when curveballs come, they don't derail us. We're prepared. And we know how to respond to them instead of just react out of fear. Okay? So choose to respond, not to react. Okay? Would be a good thing to do. Also, choose to be prepared, not scared. Right? So many people in this moment are so scared about what's going to happen. We don't have to be scared about those things. Now, get some Clorox wipes. We need to obey the authorities that are around us, okay? That are telling us, stay inside. If you don't have to go anywhere, don't. You know, use some hand sanitizer. Wash your hands. We even posted this. Such a great thing. I saw Janet Valentin posted this on her social media about washing your hands and saying the Lord's Prayer. That's the exact amount of time you should be washing your hands. Say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's been a great habit that I've put into play in my life. I love it. And God told us this is the way we should be praying. See, it eliminates the fear because we're focusing on our faith. Focus on your faith, not on fear. Because fear is a nasty, unrelenting, absolutely exhausting, cyclical thing that goes around and around and you'll just spiral into this abyss of fear, okay? You don't need to be afraid at this moment. In fact, we should be prepared. In fact, the scripture tells us based on biblical principles what we should be doing. I love all you guys are on here and you're commenting. It is so great. I want to show you, uh, we're going to keep going in, going in here with this. But man, so good to see the Stapletons, the Womax. Oh, so good to see Jamie Bailey in here. But look at this, right? Acts chapter 2 talks about being connected. And if we commit ourselves to being connected to each other, right? Again, we're separate, but we're not alone. We're separating, okay? this I don't even want to use the words, oh, we're isolated. No, we're not isolated. We're probably spending more time with our family than we have in a long time. And our family probably needs it. I know mine did. I don't have it all figured out. I'm not doing it perfectly, but I can tell you this much. We've played more cards lately than ever. We've hung out with each other. I've had more conversations with my kids in the past two weeks than probably the past two months. Right? God is doing something really special. And this connection is really critical. So go. I'm going to read this to you to Acts 2.42. It says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed together had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing them and the proceeds to all, as any who had need. And day by day, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad hearts and generous hearts. They were praising God having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here's what the early church did, guys. They got together. They hung out with each other. Now, right now, that's a little bit difficult. But maybe we need to get back to the basics. Maybe some of the things that got us to where we are today, one of the greatest nations ever, were biblical values. And maybe... God would love to encourage us in this moment to go back to the fundamentals, to go back to being together with each other. Because at the end of the day, a lot of our distractions right now are slowly dwindling. We can't just go anywhere we want. We can't just do whatever we want. But if we focus ourselves on what this Acts 242 through 47 says, Let's see at the net result of what happened when they did these things. They said there was unity. 
Do we need more unity in our community today? We need unity for the community, right? It's even part of the word, guys. See what's going on there? Provision. God provided for them when they put themselves in a position to be blessed. He provided. They sacrificed. Instead of going to the store and stealing toilet paper out of somebody else's grocery cart, maybe give somebody some rolls of yours. Given it will be given unto you, right? Press down, shaking together, overflowing. Not steal and get yours, so that that way nobody can get you. No, 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 no. We should be the exact people that are blessing others right now. It's a dark time right now for a lot of people. And the church is the hope of the world. Christians are a light, okay? Don't hide your light under a bushel. No, let it shine. Where does light shine brighter? In darkness. So we should be in some of those dark places. You see, I think too many times we as Christians, we try to just get together and have a big candle party. Which, right now, we can't do that together. Maybe we should shine some light in some areas where people are really struggling. I had an awesome dude in my church. They're online watching. Jordan Wood, everybody. Everybody give a shout out to Jordan Wood. Watch this story about Jordan. He's been calling me this week. You know what his biggest frustration has been? He wants to go feed the homeless. He tried to go to McDonald's and order 200 cheeseburgers. And he called me because he was frightened. He's like, damn, I just can't get it done. And I'm like, well, what are you trying to do, dude? And he goes, I want to go down to Adam and get the homeless right now. Who's thinking about those guys? He goes, I was on my heart and I want to do this. I want to get into this, right? I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to help these people. And here's what's happening. He goes, I tried to get in the drive up. There was like 48 people. And when I got there, they couldn't service my order. So I tried to call them ahead and order it ahead. And he goes, I tried calling for three hours. He tried calling McDonald's for three hours and they wouldn't pick up the phone. Talk about great. Talk about a guy I'm glad is in my church. Talk about a guy who's living it out. He's not perfect. He's probably a little embarrassed I'm telling this story right now. But you know what? I want to promote positive behavior. I want to promote when people are doing something that is trying to help the community. He went and bought bread and peanut butter and sandwiches yesterday and said, we'll just make sandwiches and go hand them out. Good for him. This is the exact moment when the church needs to mobilize. The church needs to be looking in their community. How do we go help? We're not scared. Take precautions. Do what you should do. Obey the laws of the land. Understand authority. Yes, for sure. But we should be helping people. We should be in moments right now. We should be the most creative. Ready? The church should be the most creative place on the planet. We have connection to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of everything. Talk about the most creative dude ever. God, right? Created everything. So we should be being just as creative, finding solutions. And when we commit ourselves to each other in that connection that we're talking about out of Acts 2, right? He provided because people were seeking him. They were praying. It created community, generosity, like I was talking about Jordan. Praise and worship came out of it. More people got saved. That's the net result. I mean, that is the net result of what we're talking about. And when you go back to Colossians chapter 1, you see being filled with all spiritual knowledge, okay? We're going to need guides. We're going to need help. Mentors matter. You should get a mentor. You should seek one out. You should try to find someone who can help you with this. I know pastors who would love to. I know I would love to help you. I know we have people all in our church who are saying, we would love to help. Just let us know. In fact, this is what it says in Titus 2, 1 through 8. It says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men, be sober-minded. Be dignified. Be self-controlled. Sound in your faith. In love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not slaves to too much wine. Okay, they're to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, working and submissive to their own husbands, and that the word of God may be, that it would not be reviled. Likewise, urge younger men to be self-controlled. All these things are for young men, young women, 
Show yourselves respect to be models of good works and your teaching show integrity. It's telling us young men, listen to older men. Okay, and I have mentors. I have guides that are helping me. I have people that that help me not fall down and make dumb mistakes. That doesn't mean I don't make some still. But I've got people in my life who are committed to me, who are mentors, who can be guides, who can help me not make foolish errors. And you need a good mentor, okay? So seek one out because they can help you to understand the spiritual spiritually what's happening so good jenny tarn accountability accountability equals game changer dead true you only get better when you're held accountable if it's not measured not done if there wasn't a test why study when you have people around you that will encourage you who love you who will say you can do better let's go it helps them okay this week we were out at my ranch, not my ranch, sorry, we were out at the ranch, okay, a friend of mine's ranch, um, big slip there, uh, and my son got on his motorcycle and he wanted to ride it and get out there, kind of right out of the gate, he gets going, right, and he goes kind of hop onto a little concrete pad and he just, the wheel kind of wobbles a little bit, boom, face plants over, falls on his wrist, right, he kind of breaks the front brake lever, Lots of tears happening, okay? You know, we've all been there. We've all made these mistakes, right? And I walk up, and here's a, here you go. Here's a great story of a failure as a dad. I'm like, you all right? You okay, bro? All right, get up. Let's go. Get back on the bike. Tears, sobbing, trying to pull the helmet off. I can't breathe, dad. I can't breathe. I'm like, get back on the bike. This is my wrist. I can't feel my wrist. My wrist doesn't hurt. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. I'm like, oh, dude. I got so frustrated, I'm like, fine, go in the house and cry about it. So you got to get back on this bike and get going. I totally failed in this moment. Okay, this is, this is not an encouraging story, right, where I'm like, I led with integrity and I loved him the right way. No, he wiped out, and Dad added insult to injury. I'm like, get back on the bike. What do you do, cry about this your whole life? This is not, you don't play sports? Come on, man, get back on the horse and get going. Goes inside, cries about it. Probably a couple hours later, I finally come to my reasons, right? And I'm like, oh. I talked to him and said, hey, bro, you doing okay? Yeah, I'm good. So you mad at dad? He goes, no. I said, why? Well, I was kind of hard on you, wasn't I? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, he goes, I know you just wanted what was best for me. He goes, I want you to, I know you wanted me to be better. I'm like, this kid is more spiritual than his dad. He got it. I was trying to hold him accountable. Now, I wasn't doing it nice. But he got it, okay? He got it. So we need mentors. We need guys that can help us along. Love seeing you guys jump on here. Man, we got Corey. Whoa, all the way from New York. Man, you guys can go to our, I'm you got a question. Uh, <laughs> how do we financially support the ministry? Well, if you guys want to do that, you can go to cornerstonechurchatx.com. There's an app. You can download it. It shows you there. You can give through the app. You can give online. Um, you can also do a text in to give. Um, as well, but we'll mention that a lot of stuff later. But back to mentors, like you really need good mentors, okay? And you've got to have them around you to push you to be better than you currently are, okay? So check this out in Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. It even says this: Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. All that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We need to be making disciples. You see, a lot of people tell me that they're leaders. And I want to just look behind them and go, if you're a leader, who's following you? How have you replaced yourself? So even if you're in a church, because I've seen a lot of people hop online here that are not even in Texas. I mean, if you're in a church... Go help your pastor out. Go make disciples. Share your faith and reproduce you so that, that way that's a help to your church. guess it begs a question. Would your pastor want more of you in his church? I don't know. Man, Jordan Wood's killing it this week. He wants to go serve 200 hamburgers to the homeless. I need more dudes like him. I want him reproducing himself in five more dudes. Because that would be more people that are helping the homeless. 
that's awesome. But we've got to be about discipleship making, not just getting together to check the box of church. In fact, God, it's a little difficult right now, guys, for us to check the box of church, right? We, we've got to get in, invested. We've got to do something. That segues perfect into what it says in verse 10. Walk worthy of the Lord. Walking worthy. What does that mean? Okay, is there anything we can do to earn God's favor? No. At the end of the day, it's by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. End of story. Okay? But there are certain things that we can do when we work worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him. If you go back to verse 9, I'll read it again, or 10, it says, So walk worthy in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Then it tells us, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So when we increase our knowledge of God and we bear fruit, we are pleasing God. We are doing things for him, okay? We're not doing him favors. It's not like he needs us, but we get to partner with the Lord. And when we do, it's incredible what can happen, okay? But in order to please him, bear fruit. Do the things that he asks us to do. If you want to know how God feels about people that are supposed to be bearing fruit and they don't, or things that should bear fruit and don't, Read Mark 11. There was a fig tree he walked by. And the fig tree didn't have fruit. The tree wasn't doing what it was designed to do. So what happened to it? Your Bible. Don't be mad at me. It's your word. It's our Bible. It's God's word. We should be bearing fruit. And when people look at our lives... We know that we're going to get the end of our lives and we're going to be measured by our fruit. You could measure anything by its fruit. If I walk up to a tree and I see apples on it, I know it's an apple tree. When people walk up to your life, what do they see? Do they see more Jesus? Do they see compassion? Do they see empathy? Do they see humility? That's a hard one. Do they see generosity? Do they see the marks of our Savior in the way we work and we worship? Our commitments, our standards. How do we make choices? See, we're, well, I'll speak right to it, right? Financially, this is a very weird time. I had a gentleman call me in our church and he said, man, I got a 20% you know, decrease. Because, but you know what? At least I've got my job. I was like, you nailed it, bro. You nailed it. James 1, rejoice when you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith works perseverance. You strengthen the muscles when things are tough. Nobody's looking for a bad time, but it's in the hard times that we get stronger, that we get grittier, that we get more intense and focused on the message. We get intense and we get focused on the mission that God's given us. And we've got to get after those things because it matters. There are people now who need more of Jesus than ever. And it's not a time for the church to be quiet. In fact, the church is not a building, everybody. It's not. It's not flashing lights. It's not even worship songs. It's the called out ones, the ecclesia. The called out ones who love him and are doing what he says. Bearing fruit. People need to be bearing fruit. What's one of the ways we can bear fruit? What is one of the things that please the Lord when people repent? Not a lot of talk about this right now. There's a lot of talk about we've got to come together as a church, which is true. Come together as a church. But man, think about what Chronicles says. Everyone's quoting the verses all over social media. If my people repent, turn from doing their own own things seek my face I will hear their prayer and I will heal their land talk about what we need right now we need healing in our land we need healing in homes we need healing in marriages we need healing in relationships 
but we've got to repent. In other words, I'm walking this way. Repent is turning 180 degrees and walking this way. And we've got to be different. We've got to change what we're doing. If we don't want to see the same result over and over and over again, we've got to change what we're doing. And we've been given a divine reset. We've been given an opportunity to stay home, to focus on what matters, and to get into his word and find out what do you think about this and what do you want me to do about this? What's my role in this? Do I go push carts at HEB, God's greatest grocery store, because they're working so hard in there to restock shelves that we can put the carts back for them? Or what if I get sick? What? Wow, first, wear gloves. Second, take Clark's wives. Third, God's good enough to keep your eternity in his hand, but he can't keep your health in his hand? Come on, man. We got to believe better than that. We got to be doing better than that. We can get after this, okay? We can be light and we can be hope and we can be encouragement in these moments, okay? But we've got to tell the truth in love. We got to start saying what the scripture says. Because in times like this, talk about people need truth. The truth is, we got to stop doing our own things. And even in churches, we get way off track. We'll start just doing things because it's things to do. And we're not human doings. We're human beings. And we need to be with him. John 14 and 15, 16. He's the vine, we're the branches. We do what we see our father do. The question is this. What has God showed you this week that you should be doing? Have we quieted down enough to even listen? Have we spent time trying to hear from him? Have we spent the time to go, God, what do you want me to do on my street? I know what I'm going to end up doing on my street. I'm going to go six feet, six feet distance, no big deal. But I'm just going to ring on their doorbells and just check in on them and say, hey, I'm praying for you. If there's anything you need, let us know. My house is right down here. You want to know why? Because they're my neighbors. And they might need help. And maybe now is a good time to let them know I'm praying for them. Maybe my neighbors need to know there's a pastor that lives on their block. Because we live in suburbs where we're three feet from each other, but we couldn't be more apart. We couldn't be more separate. We couldn't be more isolated. And it's time for the church to rise up and do what God's called us to do. Here's what it says in Matthew 25. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you by the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer Jesus saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we feed you? When were you thirsty and we gave you drink? And when did, were you in prison and we visited you? And the king will answer them and say, truly, as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. Church, it's time. It's time. It's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to be in the community. Now, obey the authorities of the land. But be light. Be blessing. The way you're going to get to know what to do in a time like this is by reading this. Spending time praying. Spending time in the word and if you know what his word says then you know what his will is if you know his word you know his will and if I've seen anything that's a bigger question mark for most people in Christianity in America I just don't know what God's will for me is 66 books written full of it pages waiting to be read time in prayer time with him Time reading, sacrificing, giving, preparing people for what God wants to do. We love you guys. 
Thank you guys for joining us. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, glad you guys joined us. All my Aggie friends. Um, glad you guys are here. We appreciate you. We love you. We are praying for you. If you need anything, please reach out. Let us know. We want to be a help. Um, we want to be a guide. We want to help right now. We're not sure how long that we're going to be doing this digitally, but for right now, this is what we're doing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> people in the church will be reaching out to you and being able to give you a little bit more uh, information about how we're going to be doing things. And again, earlier somebody asked this question. Uh, if you want to go to the Cornerstone Church, ATX.com, you can give help, you know, help be faithful. Um, we still are a church with a budget that wants to be able to bless people, be the homeless. Uh, do those things. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you guys um, for all your love and support. We appreciate you. God's got this. We ain't going anywhere. Everything is going to go great. Whoa, Amy. Great to see you. Glad you joined us. Uh, love you guys. Keep the comments coming. Um, we're going to keep doing this together. Anything that we can do. Oh, our college students are back. May, Brooke, good to see you guys. Stay safe. Uh, make wise choices. Okay. But guys, really, this week, dig into the Word. Find out what He wants you to do. Okay, go back to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and say, God, what do you want from me? Seek a mentor. Look for guide. Let's go make disciples. Okay, let's go reproduce who we are um, in other people. But let's make sure that that's a good thing first. Okay, because um, you've got this. Yeah, you're right, Sandra. God's got this. Okay, He hasn't lost control. In fact, Here's what I believe. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it right here. Cornerstone is going to do better than it's ever done because of times like this where we're going to sink in. We're going to dig in. We're going to widen our stance. We're going to, we're going to shoulder the load. We're going to get after this because God has work to be done in this community and he's called us to do it and we get to be a part of it. So I can't wait to see how we're going to come out of this stronger than we've ever been more connected than we've ever been, praying more than we've ever prayed, more generous than we've ever been, with stories, okay, with, with testimonies of how God's provided and what he's done. I sat on my driveway here um, for about an hour with a good friend of mine in my community, and he's just he's talking about how God's speaking to him, and I'm like, bro, that's so different than the last three months when we were talking about that, and he goes, I know, God is doing so much. This is a time where God is going to do so much in our hearts and our lives. And I'm glad we get to do it together. I love you guys. I could do this forever. I miss you. I want to see your faces. Know this, though. We might be separate. You're not alone. God's got you. Love you. Appreciate you. You guys enjoy your day.